Now, secular humanism initiated some fundamental changes in terms of the social structure of Europe. It brought in a, a new liberalism. I'd argue that the deeper sources of humanism's liberalism are Christian because only the Bible's view of human can, uh, what a human is can lead to freedom and liberty. But this new liberalism, very much humanistic, is about securing the freedom of individuals through granting them rights. Personal rights are given to all citizens and actually guaranteed by law. And every citizen equally has rights, regardless of their race, their gender, their class, and their religion. So this is very healthy, a new liberalism, and secular humanism also brings a new economic liberalism. It really goes hard for the individual right of property and our, our liberty is in the right to, 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 to create wealth. Now this too is the legacy of Christianity but secular humanism really takes it forward. So secular humanism is now the new and progressive ideology that dominates Europe. And this has led to the marginalization of Christianity. And those of us who are European should recognize that Europe is now the most secular continent on planet Earth. We started as the dominant worldview uh, back in the first century through to the fifth, where we really, in a sense, took, took our influence. We are now today the most secular continent. That's the context we're working in. However, in the last 60 or so years, this secular continent has seen a religious challenge. And this comes in the form of a previous contender. Islam is now back on the scene in a big way. And this has caused a shift again in the religious landscape of this continent. And I think we're still trying to figure out the implications of Islam's I call it second sojourn. Now, very different, the second sojourn, they didn't come as an invading horde, we actually invited them. They came as immigrants. And this was because in the post-war period, Europe is booming economically and there's a severe labor shortage. So the industrial powers of Europe admitted many Muslims from lots of different nationalities, really depended on where their empire holdings were. So in France, they brought many, from the, the North African countries that they had colonized. And then in the UK, we invited people from the Indian subcontinent. And that included Pakistan and Bangladesh. My wife is from Bradford in the North of England. It was a center for textiles. And they invited hundreds of thousands of, of Muslims to come and work in the factories. And now they're dominant in terms of the population factor. So we brought them to our cities, the industrial centers of Europe, and that's where they tend to be concentrated today, to the places we, where we brought them to work in our factories. Now, we, we continue to invite them until our uh, European economy started to falter. This was in the mid 1970s. And most of the European, European countries who invited them is interesting. They didn't see them as immigrants. They saw them more like guest workers. And the latest research has shown that many European leaders thought they were gonna go home. They'd make some money and then go back home, but they didn't go home. And I don't blame them for that. So over the last 50 years or so, 60 years, here they are, and they have reproduced. They have tended to have lots of babies at the very same time where most of Europe has gone into a steep demographic decline. We're not having enough babies to sustain our population levels. And what this means today is that Muslims have reached a population density where they're a significant minority in a number of European countries. So this is the story of Islam's second sojourn on European soil. We invited them, they settled, and they're having lots of children. So if you look at Europe from Ireland over to Russia, in the 1970s, there was approximately 18 million Muslims. In 2000, the year 2000, there was 32 million Islamic peoples in that same section. That's a very steep rise. Interestingly enough, Russia has the largest Islamic population, 10 to 14% of, 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 of their, their national population. So if the roughly 15 to 16 million Muslims of Western Europe were a nation, they would be within the top 10 of the European Union. 
Now, this population density is having a significant impact on the religious climate of Europe. And this is interesting because back in the 1970s, sociology departments in the academy abounded with what's called secularization theories. The death of religion was heralded by, by social, sociologists. But now we knew that, we know that rumors of the death of religion were greatly exaggerated. They couldn't have been more mistaken. And of course, we see this daily in our news headlines. Think of what's going on in France over the last months. The Islamic factor is just huge in terms of that nation and its policy making. Now, another change has occurred in the last 20 years that's also important to understand. Um, and I've seen this myself in terms of my, my own experience here in the UK. Back in the 1950s and 60s and 70s, the new immigrants from Islamic nations were defined by their race rather than their religion. So I lived and pastored a church in Bradford through some of the 80s and lived in, a, in, in, a, in an Asian community. And, and they were all called Asians. Today, when I go to Bradford to visit my family, this has changed. They all identify themselves not as Asians, but as Muslims. They define themselves by their religion. And that raises an important question. Why are they defining themselves by religion rather than race? Really important for understanding the religious landscape of Europe. And I would say it's this, between the issue of race and religion is the reality of class. The majority of Muslims in Europe today are young because of the high birth rate. So there's lots of young urban Muslims and the majority of them belong to the underclass. They're part of the welfare class. They live in relative poverty, often a poverty of education. So think of the famous suburbs that surround Paris. They're almost like ghettos surrounded by these shells of factory. So what this means is that young Muslims in Europe have this deep sense of belonging to the oppressed classes. And it's this that makes them very easy for them to identify with the Islamic worlds. The Quran stresses very strongly that Muslims are the oppressed people. It's, it's part of Islamic self-understanding. And they have thousands of years of history that seems to undergird this point. They point to the Crusades, look, we are the oppressed. People are always hounding us. And they haven't forget, forgotten that back in the 18th century, European superpowers built their immense wealth on the back of Muslims, largely. Then in more recent times, they look at current global events, say in the Middle East, the Gulf War, what's going on today in places like Sudan and Syria and Lebanon. And they look at what they call the meddling of Western nation, and it adds to the oppression narrative. So here we are. The oppressed class of modern Europe are increasingly young Muslims. That's how they identify themselves. We are Muslims who are impressed, oppressed. And in the UK, it's true of other European nations uh, uh, as well, I'm sure. If you see a young Islamic woman wearing the hijab, their head covering, it's not a symbol of being a doormat. It's actually a statement of belonging to the religion of the oppressed. It's a symbol more of that. And that's true for Islamic women now too. So Islamic identity in Europe is very much about a social reality part of the oppressed class that's being now defined in a religious way. That's an incredibly dangerous mix. So that's a brief historical sketch, the place of the three main players that we're looking at. Secular humanism firmly in the majority, occupying the center ground, Christianity, a marginalized majority increasingly. And then in the last few decades, another presence, a blast from the past. Islam makes its presence known and felt across our continent. Let's now secondly look at a snapshot of the three players in terms of where we are now. What do things look like right now? And here I want to look at positive factors for all three, things that offer an advantage, and then look at negative factors, things that pose significant and challenges and threats for the three players we're looking at. I think this, this helps us get a feel 
were for, for where the, the three contenders are. Let's start with Islam. Let's look firstly at the positive factors, things that favor Islam as an ongoing force in Europe. And the first thing, perhaps the most obvious thing to mention is the positive demography. The numbers for Muslims in Europe look good. Numerically, Muslims in Europe have quadrupled between 1970 and 2000. And the projections for the future differ, but I think we can say that it's going to continue to increase. So at the, uh, at the present moment in Western Europe, Muslims make about, up about 5% of the population. There's still, of course, lots of places in, in Western Europe where Islam has little, almost no presence. Looking forward to the year 2050, those people who like to get stats and make estimates about the future, they figure that this could rise to 15%. So that's a significant rise. Now you will hear today lots of hysteria, some of it from Christians, and I think we best ignore it because it's scaremongering, that Europe is on the brink of becoming Eurabia. That is, they're going to take over because they're gonna be such a significant uh, proportion of the population. And I actually think the demography doesn't fit that picture. I think that is just pure scaremongering and we best leave it behind. But it is undoubtedly true that the Islamic population of our continent is going to rise. That's in its favor. Then secondly, we talked about the positive demography. The, the second thing is the strong loyalties and commitment that exists in Islam today. I refer, referred in my historical sketch to young Muslims who identify with Islam as the religion of the oppressed. So it makes up a large part of the European underclass. Now that gives a very strong sense of belonging. To be dispossessed connects you with other dispossessed. It's a strong identity. And it actually inspires high levels of commitment and loyalty. So this has become a source of meaning for young Muslims. And of course, meaning, belonging is crucial for humans. It undergirds our sense of identity. And it's interesting, secular youth lacks this. They generally feel empty. They feel like they belong to nothing. They have few loyalties. Their pursuits are rather banal. It's hard to, to think of anything beyond themselves. They're narcissistic. So that makes commitment and loyalty a huge challenge. Lots of talk today about commitment phobia among secular youth. This is not the case for many young Muslims. And that will give Islam in Europe a vibrancy that can't be ignored. Now you see this uh, loyalty and commitment in lots of places. I see it in their building projects. That their, their buildings are beginning to shape the cityscapes of our cities the building of mosques. It's interesting, the first generation who came in the 1950s built hardly any mosques. In 1966, there were 18 mosques in the UK. In the year 2000, there are well beyond 1,000. And in Germany, since the influx of Syrian refugees, there are tens of thousands of new mosques that's been built. So here they are, think about my country, only four to five percent of our population, but you can't help but be amazed at the visible symbols that they're erecting coming out of their commitment. The other thing that inspires their commitment and loyalty is that young Muslims are connecting to the larger story. Here's how it goes. The first generation still felt the tie of the countries they came from. We've just recently moved from a place in Cambridge, which was mainly Bengali, and I got to know a number of them, they were first generation and they had such strong memories of Bangladesh, the rural communities they came from. Those memories weren't available to the second and the third generation. So it made them feel cut off from their roots. So what did they do? They turned to a more globalized Islam, which often off, uh, uh, offers a sterner standard for what it means to be a Muslim. And they access this global Islam through the internet, through their being electronically connected. It's not through their memory, it's through electronic connection, social media. And this enables them to feel part of a big story, a story in which faith, true faith belief, defeats unbelief, overcomes the unbeliever. 
And this is a, a very important part of how their social identity is being formed. So here they are, severed from the past, rather rootless, exiles in a strange land where they're dispossessed. And now they've got connection to global Islam. So they're prime candidates for joining a glorious cause. And global Islam really has a strong historical consciousness. Secular humanism is ahistorical. It, it has no sense of memory, of connectedness to the past. It's an ahistorical phenomenon, not Islam. It relates to the past with a strong sense of connection. They're rooted in their story and that feeds their commitment. What about challenges? Challenges and threats to Islam in Europe today. Well, the first is the challenge of secular humanism. I think one of the great questions for modern Europe is this, will Islam survive modernity? Modernity is such a mighty cultural force. And we as Christians have learned that the hard way, a little bit more on that in a moment. Will Islam survive modernity? Take the issue of demography. At the moment, Islam has demography on its side. It's, they're still having babies, unlike secular people. But the question is, how long are they going to keep having babies? And there are already signs of a decline in the number of Islamic women having babies. So will the Islamic family structure survive the pressures of being secular family? Increasing number of young uh, Islamic women are being forced to work for economic reasons. So how will their birth rates continue at a high rate if many Islamic women are working? Will secular humanism challenge the core moral structures of Islam? Will Islamic youth be able to stand against the sexual revolution? which is so dominant, is such a force. Can they stand against it? Will Islam be able to retain the subordinate place of women, which is very central to the Quran? Women do not get a good look in in the Quran. Will they be able to maintain that? This, this is actually a huge challenge, the structure of Islamic family, which has very traditional values. So my point is, as Islam is going through the same kinds of pressures that Christianity had to face from secular humanism. And on so many of these issues, we failed. We, we've actually fallen. Sex before marriage, almost universally accepted by young Christians, easy divorce. We see a huge capitulation on the issue of, of, of same-sex attraction and marriage. Um, we're struggling to survive modernity, secular humanism, and Islam, my point is, is facing the same test. Another challenge which is important to understand is the competing voices within Islam, Islam to define it for the modern worlds. There's plenty of discussion amongst Muslims when you read them about what their faith is meant to look like in a European context, and different voices feed into this discussion. Now, the reason it's a diverse discussion is because there's an ethnic diversity amongst European Muslims. They come from lots of different places, and there's different definitions and interpretations of their, what their faith looks like, depending on where they come from. Uh, those of us who are not Muslims tend to symbolize Islam through the Arab states, Iran, Saudi Arabia, but it's fed from lots of different streams. Muslims from Morocco, different from Muslims from Turkey, different from Muslims from Nigeria. These have different forms of, of practice and faith. So which one's going to define its true expression? Now, there are plenty competing voices from abroad who want to get in on this action. From Saudi Arabia, Arabia, we have the Wahhabis. This is a, an incredible story of a reform movement that goes back to the 18th century. And the Wahhabis see most Muslims around the world as being infidels, not just Christians who are infidels and humanists. Many Muslims themselves are seen as infidels and the mission is bring them back to the true faith. It's a rather radical Islam. But the thing is, there's a huge amount of oil money behind it. Lots of Wahhabi money funds the building of mosques in Europe. There's also a challenge between Shia Islam and Sunni Islam, which of these is gonna take control on European soil. And of course, in Islamic nations in the Middle East, especially warfare between these two competing Islamic 
um, sects, if you like and call them. The Sufis, we can't get into any detail, detail here, but the Sufis are to Islam what the monastic orders were to Catholicism. They're incredibly active politically, and many see the Sufis as key to Islamic expansion and consolidation in Europe. They're highly adaptable, very resilient, and very active to try and get the heart of Islam in Europe on their terms. There's also, in terms of competing voices, a generational conflict. You can see mosques divided between the views of the older generation, who tend to be quite moderate, and the younger generation, who can often tend to be quite radical. There's a, a shocking generation gap, which is part of the internal conflict. This is also played out in families. I saw this on the street that I lived, lived in until not long ago. So all these competing factors trying to define the heart of European um, Islam. And, and these are threatening the stability of it. It's a real challenge. Okay, that's enough about Islam, positive factors to its advantage and the things that threaten it. Let's take a brief look at secular humanism. Let's look at the positive factors. And the first is that for the moment it rules. Secular humanism is king. It's the dominant cultural force, and there's no indication that I can see that this is going to decline. And despite certain challenges that we'll look at at the moment, it's going to dominate the cultural, political, and economic life of Europe well into the future. There might be a revival on the scale of the Great Awakening that occurred in the uh, late 18th century under the Wesleys and Whitfield. Maybe something like that can turn it, but I see it's sticking around for a long way. It's not just gonna roll over and die, it has huge force and influence and it gives essential shape to Western civilization and in its, cur in its current form. Because <clears throat> all the commitments go deep into the fabric of how we think and how we relate and how we live. So that's, that's the positive thing in its advantage, it is king. But it's, it's important to look at some of the challenges and the first I've already referred to is the challenge of religion. Christianity has declined, but it hasn't died. And Islam is on the rise. And so both of these are firmly entrenched in Europe. So the complete secularization of Europe is a pipe dream that never materialized. Religion is here to stay. And secular humanism is struggling to cope with the challenge of religion. It can't ignore it anymore, although it's amazing, it tries to do that. The European Union constitution basically dealt with religion by almost ignoring it and, and pretending it didn't exist. But it's getting harder and harder for secular humanists to ignore religion. So what are they gonna do with it? Now, one of the reason it's not going to go away and it's not going to become more secularized in terms of how it's practiced is religion in the form of Christianity and Islam is, is committed to a transcendent reality. It's not naturalistic. And, that, and religion provides in terms of meaning what secular humanism will never provide. Secular humanism is so impoverished when it comes to the meanings that humans naturally crave. I call these super meanings. Humans were made for super meanings, for the big meanings that, that support our existence. And all of these meanings are found beyond the borders of nature. But secular humanism rooted in naturalism has this poverty of meaning. It's a meaning vacuum. And, and it's, it's carving people out. It's making them increasingly empty. And that's a challenge for secular humanism. And more and more people, I believe, are going to start looking to the old religion, Christianity, because modernity is not delivering in terms of super meanings. Now, this is actually added to by the fact that Christianity has left its signature all over this continent. There's lots of talk about Europe being Christ or post-Christian, which means Christ forgetful. But I like the way Charles Taylor reflects that Europe is also Christ haunted. We are simultaneously Christ forgetful, Christ haunted. We can't escape the roots of our past. 
And that's for lots of reasons, but there are just so many echoes of Christianity on our landscape. In every town, I live in a tiny village now, just outside of Cambridge, there's a big church. Church architecture dominates almost every village, town, city in, in, in Europe. A place like Cambridge is just a city of church spires. Now, this kind of landscape, cityscape, reflects a past when it was different, when the secular humanists didn't rule, and that rustles and disturbs the memory. It's also true of our calendar. Our calendar places us in the kind of story that transcends humanism. Christmas, Easter, Pentecost coming up. But these are the big holidays, holy days, that still mark our calendar. Now, secular humanism hasn't been able to eradicate these things from our calendar. And it certainly hasn't replaced it with anything better. The only holidays that secular humanists have invented are bank holidays. It doesn't quite have the same resonance as Christmas and Easter. So the challenge is religion. The second is the current crisis in terms of modern liberalism. There are so many threats to liberty today. And, and, and COVID lockdown has really highlighted this. There are many threats to the liberal ideals that secular humanism was established on. Our public square is becoming increasingly chaotic. We have seen the, we have seen politics very quickly become extreme to both sides. We've, and, and that's led to the loss of middle ground politics. We see today the threat of extremists, terrorist acts that keep happening on, you know, within our cities. We see the challenge of identity politics where very strong minority want to right the wrongs of, of the past um, and it, it, it's creating carnage in the public space. And what's happening is the public square is quickly becoming illiberal. And we're losing certain liberties, which have been foundational. I would say, again, rooted in Christianity, but freedom of conscience, freedom of speech, and even freedom of religion are being seriously threatened. I'm meeting Christians in the United Kingdom who, who, who are under enormous pressure from their employees to wear the rainbow, the symbol of LGBT. There's veiled threats. The law still protect them, protect, protects them here, but it's a real tester. Veiled threats, you must wear the rainbow. So the public square is descending into a kind of chaos and confusion that may well make secular humanists go back on their liberalism. They may meet the anarchy with tyranny. And I think it's becoming increasingly likely that, that the future of Europe in, under the control of the secular humanists is moving back to a more kind of totalitarian state, the very thing it labored to avoid. So Islam, things to its advantage, demography especially, but the challenge is that secular humanism, it's king, but it too meets some serious challenges. Let's finish with Christianity. And let me begin here with the challenges and the threats, and then we're gonna end on the high note, with the positive, with the hope. So what's the challenges? Well, first of all, the challenge is declining numbers. Since the 1960s, the trend has been steadily downwards in terms of church attendance. And in this country, in terms of the Church of England, this is catastrophic. 10 years ago, your average vicar had two and a half parishes. Today, this is true of my little village, they cover four parishes because the decline in the Church of England has been so great. Now this decline is greater in Protestant countries than Catholic countries, but there too, one sees decline. There's a huge downturn in ordinance going forward for holy orders in, in the Catholic Church. And the only exception to declining numbers is the evangelical. So even the Church of England, has to acknowledge that the evangelicals is where the growth really lies. So they have to give some credence to what evangelicals are doing. But overall, in the big picture, declining numbers. It's a big challenge. The other challenge is the prevailing story of us Christians being the bad people of Europe. 
were people of bad repute, uh, repute and what we have offered to civilization has been largely negative. And critical theory today just accentuates that message. So the history of Europe is told in such a way that makes Christianity the whipping post. We are the sources of the bat. And the narrative of secular humanism just keeps reinforcing this. It has its own, very interestingly, creation, fall, redemption story. What's the creation part of it? Well, it was the age of the Greeks and Romans. Something beautiful was birthed then. And the fall was, oh, Christianity came into Europe, swept it under its, its influence, and we went into the dark ages. The glory of the classical ages, Christianity, dark ages, and redemption is the enlightenment and the rise of secular humanism. You see, they too have their creation, fall, redemption story, and Christianity doesn't feature very well there. So the history is told as a story of Christians who go on crusades, they burn witches, they start numerous religious wars. It's a history of patriarchy and the mistreatment of women, of slavery, of blocking scientific advancement, of being the imperial religion of colonizers, and the list goes on and on. Now, of course, there are a few threads of truth here in a large web of lies. And I am so thankful, I have to say, that there are some key thinkers in the English-speaking world who are readdressing this narrative, and they're all unbelievers. People like the late Roger Scruton, Niall Ferguson, Tom Holland, his book Dominion couldn't be more favorable to the influence of Christianity, and another who's quite remarkable, Douglas Murray. I'm, I'm collecting the insights of atheists who are actually defending Christianity against this story that we are, we are, we are the, the baddies who, who've created so much havoc. But the fact is, our history is still held against us. And I think within Europe, there is a hostile Christophobia. This is the form of persecution we endure. And I think we are under persecution, and I think it's likely to keep growing. So this is a huge threat. What about the positive factors that favor the future as I finish up? Well, we have to start, of course, with the fact that Christ is Lord of the nations and his truth and his kingdom will prevail. It's a promise. It doesn't matter how bad things are. This is our hope. Jesus, Lord of all, his kingdom shall prevail. The gates of hell will not overcome it. So we are assured of the triumph of his cause. And for that reason, we cling to this hope and we never lose hope. I have a non-Christian friend from years back and I gave him a Bible to read. And I said, you should read this because he was always criticizing it. So um, he said, okay, I'll read it. We got together a few weeks later and I said, Peter, how's it going, the Bible? He says, oh, I'm loving it. He said, I've just read Revelation and I, smacked myself on the forehead and I said, I should have told you to read any book by, Revel by Revelation. He said, why? I said, well, it's a book I don't understand. He said, well, I thought it was quite simple. I said, well, what do you mean? What does Revelation mean? What's the meaning of it? Well, he said, first of all, I liked it because it was a kind of science fiction. That's my genre. And the second thing is it has a very clear message and it's this, you guys are gonna win. And I thought, brilliant. Here, my skeptical friend got the message of Revelation in a nutshell. We, under the Lordship of Christ, are going to win. That's the hope we cling to. Other positive factors, the weight of history. I mentioned this earlier, the symbols on our landscapes that reflect our Christian past. And much of the heritage of this continent is rooted in what Christianity gave and gave in a very positive way. I work for an organization called Christian Heritage. We do historical apologetics to try and turn back this, this false story that everything we did was negative. And thankfully, as I said, there are atheists who are doing the same. Jürgen Habermas is someone who fascinates me. He belongs to what's known as the Frankfurt School of Philosophers. They are, these are neo-Marxists and the inventors of critical theory. Here's what Habermas says, Christianity and nothing else is the ultimate foundation of liberty, conscience, human rights, and democracy, the benchmarks of Western civilization. To this day, we have no other options to Christianity. We continue to nourish ourselves from this source 
Everything else is postmodern chatter. Wow. From one of the inventors of critical th uh, theory, this positive endorsement, uh, which is the weight of history that we have on our side. The other thing I mentioned as I close is the emergence of a revitalized Christianity. There are new kinds of Christians abounding in Europe today. There's a vibrant Christian presence, and it may be as influential as it's been for decades, if not the last hundred years. And I think we shouldn't confuse institutional decline in, in terms of the church with the uprooting of faith. And while it's true that many nominal Christians have slipped away, those who have remained have become stronger, higher levels of dedication and commitment to Christ. So though we're a minority group, and we have to say here we're still larger than the Muslim presence, we are a stronger minority group. And of course, being minority status is not a disaster for Christianity. Many times in the history of the church, Christians have been minority in their cultures. And it's often being a minority that revitalizes faith. Now, one great development in Europe over the last 30 years is the growth of immigrant churches. African churches, East Asian churches, Latin American churches, <clears throat> these have actually brought a vibrancy to Christianity in Europe. Some of these are, are huge uh, and very, very active for the gospel. And many of them tell me they want to repay their obligation to Europe because European missionaries went to their lands, they see the secular continent, they want to come back and bless us. So there's thousands of missionaries in the UK, many of them from Africa, who are, are playing their part. And these provide networks for Christians. And I see this happening in Cambridge. Much of the converting of people to Christianity in Cambridge is through immigrant students, uh, foreign students who come here and, 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 and hear the gospel for the first time. So despite the challenges, we have everything to hope for. We shouldn't be discouraged. Christ is Lord of all the nations. And although Europe has been largely lost, it's become secularized, I do believe that we will be the first continent to reconvert. No other continent has converted, become secular, and then been reconverted. And I think we have every reason to believe under Christ's reign and rule and the power of the Holy Spirit that this will happen. And of course, the only way it's going to happen is through the faithful proclamation of the gospel. So take heart keep going, have courage despite the challenges, and cling to your hope.